אהלן, צהריים טובים. היי, צהריים טובים. היי, שלום. מה נשמע מאיר? טוב, תודה. מתרגש. טוב, לא עושים את זה הרבה פעמים בחיים, אז טוב להתרגש, כן. Hello, Federico. Hello, Ilaria. Hi. Good to see Hi you. Hi there. שלום אורן. היי אהרון ברודי. היי, גוד מורנינג. בוקר טוב. בוקר טוב. סורי, אני קצת לילה. Four minutes before it's not late. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Aaron. Morning. Aaron, in the Holy Land, it's almost time to go to sleep. So I don't know about Boker Tov. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, you know, as Californians, we're always off by... <laughs> Aaron, it's almost six in the morning for you. Yeah, that's right. I really appreciate your, uh, <laughs> your sacrifice here. I, I suggest you go get another cup of coffee. It looks like you need it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm loaded. Okay, uh, Adi texted me, she will be in, in a second. There must be more people in YouTube already. Okay. 
close. Okay, hello everybody. It's four o'clock sharp here in Israel time, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to the sixth meeting this year of the uh, stage for the Israeli the, for the history of the land of Israel and the Jewish people, and I'm very very happy to welcome you to the book celebration of Meir Edrei, Phoenician Identity in Context, Material Cultural Koine in the Iron Age Levant. It's a special pleasure to open the stage now for the first time in English. This is our first uh, meeting taking place in English. And uh, I welcome all the newcomers and I would like to invite Professor Adi Ehrlich of the Zeman Institute of Archaeology, University of Haifa, to greet uh, mail. Please. Thank you very much, and a good afternoon slash morning uh, to those who are oversea or over the ocean. Um, so the first time I met Meir was when he gave a, a talk a couple of years ago on child sacrifice, on Phoenician child sacrifice. Well, I must admit he was a bit gloomy, but still a very, very good paper. I was impressed very much by uh, the originality and the, the ideas and, and the, the data he brought. And uh, that's why I'm not surprised that the, your book, Mail is one of these books that are both meant to be read and used. Sometimes there are some books that are only for reading, some books are mostly for using, but yours seems to be one of these rare books that you both read in depth and then use it for your research uh, because you didn't leave uh, any stone unturned and it is both comprehensive and innovative. And even me, that I'm, I am specialize in the wrong or right periods in terms of Phoenicia, my interest starts when you ends in the early Hellenistic period. I find it very useful and I would like to thank you for this contribution. So congratulations, and I'm looking forward to your next book. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to invite now Professor Asafis Urlandau, who is the head of the Leon Recanati Institute for Maritime Studies, the University of Haifa. Please, Asaf. Thank you very much, Dr. Zerzion. Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and names here, people that I've not seen a lot and I miss dearly. And this is a fantastic occasion to see everybody. Because this is such an important book, I prepared a so short written statement about what I think about it, but there's also a Phoenician tale inside, so you will not be bored. We've gathered here to celebrate the publication of Dr. Meir Dre's book, Phoenician Identity in Context, Material Culture, Koine in the Iron Age Levant. We may ask, what is Phoenician culture? What is Phoenician cult and identity? 
course, to Herodotus, everything was really clear. He knows what is Phoenician cult and material culture associated with it. Quoting, I took a ship to Tyre in Phoenicia when I heard that there was a very holy temple of Heracles, probably Melkart. There I saw it richly equipped with many other offerings, besides that there were two pillars, one of refined gold, one of emerald. If only some of this have survived today, our lives have been much simpler. To Meredri, the Phoenicians show both continuity of cultural traits as well as considerable Mediterranean identity. The aim of the book is clearly stated, and may say, quote, throughout this book, we have got, sorry, throughout this book, I have attempted to recognize aspects of material culture unique to the Phoenicians in the Eastern Mediterranean that can serve as ethnic markers of the Phoenician cultural connect. It soon became apparent that although my study aimed to focus on the Iron Age 1 to 3, it could not be restricted to those periods alone, as many aspects of Phoenician material culture tend to demonstrate strict continuity throughout millennia, end quote. And indeed, the Phoenician culture, and especially cult, is seen as both with deep roots in the Bronze and Iron Age past, as well as very strong maritime and Mediterranean characteristics. Furthermore, the Phoenician culture is seen as source for social resilience. While reading this book, I thought about the fantastic tale of the Dionysiaca of Nonus from Panopolis on the foundation of Tyre. This charming tale of fifth century CE is not only what we expect in legends about the Phoenician, that is both sailor, the god Melka, but also emphasize the very mobile nature of the origin of the flora, fauna, even the geology of Tyre, that includes mobile seaborne objects. And so, according to this legend, two wandering rocks floated over the sea. On one of them, there was a burning olive tree with an eagle perched on top of it together with a bowl. A snake was entwined around the tree. Both eagle and snake lived in harmony. Melkart, chief deity of Tyre, ordered the native population to build a sheep and follow after the wandering rocks. The god's oracle was to sacrifice the ego so that the ambrosial rocks would stop wandering, indicating the place for the foundation of Tyre. This is a fantastic mirror image for the creation of Phoenician world. Rather than the origin, Tyre is the destination of this maritime foundation, while all elements of nature as well as culture are mobile. With the foundation of Tyre, new order is installed, overcoming the supernatural of wandering, eagle and snake do not live in harmony anymore. The cult of Melkart is being installed, and perhaps even the burning olive tree becomes an ordinary one. Reading Mayer's book, one of the most ambitious attempts, to my opinion, in recent years to characterize the very essence of Phoenician culture, one feels indeed the attempt of organizing Phoenician culture but at the same time, not losing the joy common to so many who study this truly remarkable Mediterranean society. During the last four years, I was fortunate to work closely with Mayer on other projects connected with the Phoenicians, such as the Shavetzion figurines, together with Professor Adi Ehrlich, and the Achziv publication, together with Dr. Eran Arie. I wish we would have many, many more adventures with the Phoenicians in the future. So, on behalf of the Rekanati Institute for Maritime Studies, I would like to congratulate Mary on this very, very fine scholarly achievement, and we are all happy and proud to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asaf. And uh, now I would like to invite Professor Orenthal, and uh, it's coming from the Department of Archaeology and Engineering Tel Aviv University, and he will be the chair of the session and the discussion. Please, Oren, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lily. Um, I would like to join uh, all my predecessors uh, with congratulating Mayor, and it really gives me a pleasure to uh, chair this event on the occasion of his newly published monograph. Phoenician identity in context, especially given my long-standing acquaintance with Mayer from his BA studies in Tel Aviv University in the early 2000s, I think, and throughout his involvement in archaeological projects 
uh, we led, I led together with him uh, in the last decade and a half, I think. The publication of uh, his monograph is the results of his PhD studies in the Johannes Gothenburg Universität Mainz in Germany, where he completed a dissertation basically titled The Phoenicians in the Eastern Mediterranean during the Iron Age 1 to 3. Uh, it was approved with distinction, cum laude, and I was fortunate enough to be a member of the doctoral advisory committee and one of its referees. So I can uh, frankly conclude that Mary's innovative in a sense, multidisciplinary approaches provide the scholarly community with an up-to-date study uh, on Phoenician, uh, basically up-to-date study on that, that will provoke many discussion on Phoenician identity and self-definition uh, as demonstrated also in the PhD and also in papers that were rooted from this uh, PhD published in the, I think, recent decade. Uh, the revised, augmented, and enlarged PhD-based monograph, whose publication is the, been celebrated today, focuses on key issues of Phoenician material culture in Levantine Phoenician sites during the Iron Age and the Persian period that may serve as ethnic markers of Phoenician culture. Uh, modern science often tends to emphasize the regional and autonomous nature of the Phoenician city-states during the Iron Age, However, through an examination of the Phoenician material culture as manifested in architecture, religion and cult, and maritime culture, Mary has demonstrated that key elements reoccur in Phoenician sites from Tel Sukkas on the north to Ashkelon on the south of the Eastern Mediterranean. These elements indicate cultural commonness that reflects Phoenician ethnicity and a conscious, broadly defined identity. Mayer has also shown that many aspects of the Phoenician culture can be explained by and are a direct result of the environmental conditions in which this culture was developed in. With this short introduction in mind, we will now listen to three talks on related Oren, we don't hear you. Owen is experiencing some technical difficulties. Shall we? I suggest that we will move to the first speaker, yeah. uh, and then Oren will join in when he when he can. Is it possible? Um, shall I introduce him instead? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, First speaker is Runa. Let me just. I'm here and I hope you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I'll just. Luckily, I have your. Um... Yeah. Just a second. Sorry for this, everyone. <laughs> Okay, I can't seem to find your um, <clears throat> section. 
Mayor, would you like me to, to uh, introduce Gunnar? Please. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. So may I, may I introduce Professor Gunnar Lehmann from the Ben Gurion University in the Negev. Uh, Gunnar Lehmann is a veteran of several decades of excavations in both <laughs> Israel and Turkey, dealing with the Iron Age, but all facades of the Iron Age, from the earliest Iron Age and indeed from the late Bronze Age, all the way to the early Hellenistic period. And Gunnar is one of the most qualified people to speak about the Phoenicians because he is also a co-director of the Telkisan project together with David Schlon. <clears throat> and so may I invite you to take this virtual podium, Professor Lehmann. Thank you very much, Professor Asaf. <laughs> well, uh, thank you also for your warm words, Asaf. Uh, I feel it's like being here among friends and uh, so not the um, official. Anyway, so I hope that you can hear me, that we don't have uh, technical problems as we just uh, realized. And um, I think I should right start with a short presentation that I prepared. And um, can I uh, be enabled to show a um, my, my PowerPoint presentation? Would that be someone enable me to do that? <clears throat> You're enabled. Enabled? Great. Okay. Here we are. I hope you can all see this. So it's an honor and pleasure, of course, to uh, be here today and celebrate Meir's book. And uh, I shouldn't say that uh, there is a new trend towards Phoenician archaeology in the southern Levant in Israel. I think the many scholars are, or maybe not many, but the very important scholars are working here in Israel uh, on um, Phoenician archaeology. And I think uh, what I'd like to show you today also is that uh, uh, we here in Israel have, uh, I think, to contribute uh, some important research to the question. And I, <clears throat> as you can see already in the title here of my presentation, I'm um, making here the case of something that we should, that we are calling here Southern Phoenicia. Now, of course, um, Southern Phoenicia has very different meanings in the study of many different uh, colleagues. And uh, often Southern Phoenicia is just related to the Southern part of Lebanon. But our case here is that um, uh, while Phoenicia is certainly concentrated in Lebanon, as you can see on this map, <coughs> and I understand there's no problem seeing them, the, my presentation, right? I mean, that's uh, technically important. So you can see that uh, in the red circle that uh, we have on this slide here, we can see uh, classical Phoenicia. We all agree that this is um, uh, uh, located in, Islam, in uh, Lebanon, sorry for that. But of course, I'm making here the case now of Southern Phoenicia, and um, I would place that Southern Phoenicia not in Southern Lebanon, but beyond the border in, uh, in the modern state of Israel at the uh, western coast of, um, on the, on the western coast of Galilee. And uh, that would be the area that appears in the smaller map, which is situated here. Of course, um, I'm relating it very much to research of my dear colleague uh, Ayelet Gilboa uh, from Haifa University, uh, who has uh, recently uh, done a lot to advance this um, notion of Southern Phoenicia. And I saw in, uh, her name on the participants, and so I welcome her too here. Um, Southern Phoenicia would be then the area that we can see here south of Ras Nakura, Rosh Anikra in Hebrew, and probably going down to a door with such important sites as Achziv with its uh, cemeteries, uh, Tel Kabri excavated uh, by Professor Yasuo Lando, uh, it's the host here, and of course uh, by uh, Kempinski. Uh, the important site of Akko, Tel Kisan, uh, Shikmona now uh, hopefully uh, soon published fully Tel Abu Hawam and the important excavations of Tel Dor 
And already the big question, shall we add Rosh Zai to this or not? <clears throat> so then Phoenicia would be already geographically in its uh, definition, or if you want in its identity, be something um, that needs to be discussed and defined in more detail. And what I'd like to show and point out here is that there are, in my view at least, the several stages in the development and several ways towards uh, a definition or maybe uh, less precise here to a, uh, an location of what Phoenicia could be intellectually or also academically. And I very much like the another notion of Ayelet Gilboa, who has recently called this in our, in our discourses, the Phoenician process. Now the Phoenician process, I think, uh, maybe Ayelet can relate to that later in the discussion also. Phoenician process, I think, captures very well um, that this is a very dynamic process uh, during the Iron Age in which uh, coastal communities in Lebanon and the Southern Levant develop into what we uh, later in the eighth and seventh century then find under the notion of Phoenicia in Greek literature. Um, <clears throat> one of the important discoveries uh, of Ayele Gebor and Yuval Goren was in the past that um, uh, pottery of the 11th and late 11th and 10th century BCE that has been classically uh, identified as being Phoenician in quotation marks was also produced outside of Lebanon. And uh, we, we have known this for a while as being also as products in Cyprus, but now it became clear that a substantial part of the so-called Phoenician pottery was in fact pr produced in sites such as Dor. Even Megiddo has produced some of these ceramics. <clears throat> and this triggered to some extent uh, a discussion of how we should uh, identify Phoenicia at this very early stage, at a very early emergence of a material culture that possibly can be uh, called Phoenician, or should we call it Phoenician at all, if it's outside of Lebanon. If it's, for example, produced in a site such as Tel Dor, which is, according to the Venamun uh, papyrus, uh, the Egyptian uh, text, uh, as a, uh, a town of the Sikhals, which is uh, traditionally identified with the Sea Peoples. So there are lots of uh, questions coming up with this new discovery. <clears throat> and I've recently I tried to um, advance the discussion a little bit and to and developing it into what I would uh, suggest uh, being a discussion on the uh, political economy of communities involved in this process which I think um, have, uh, are essential for the emergence of early Phoenicia. Political economy would then include a study of the political and the economic process uh, uh, that is involved. And in this uh, perspective, I would suggest to see, uh, uh, to connect the Phoenicians with a, with a phenomenon that's been long known now and that is the continuation of late Bronze Age uh, settlement structures uh, uh, throughout the Iron Age one and into the Iron into the tenth century of uh, what we call Iron two A early. <clears throat> so, the phenomenon was that um, uh, uh, a landscape of small city states. I have to condense this very complex discussion into a few minutes, of course, here that the uh, city-states uh, network that uh, survived the, the uh, transition from the late Bronze Age into the early Iron Age in the uh, northern part of Israel formed something as a, a core region that participated in a very particular uh, political economy that included other communities, for example, in Lebanon, maybe also in Cyprus, in a non-centralized, uh, multi-directional, uh, network of commercial maritime exchange. Again, this is a very complex uh, uh, subject and I'm really condensing this very shortly. And I think the earliest Phoenician identity that we can possibly uh, capture 
would be connected with this specific form of small coastal communities communicating and exchanging in this multidirectional um, network. Um, although, <clears throat> unfortunately, none of these communities is excavated in a way as we have here uh, in Megiddo, in the in uh, which is, of course, an inland site. Uh, but still, one of these uh, surviving uh, late Bronze Age uh, city-states that now exists in the 11th and early 10th century BCE. And um, we don't know uh, archaeologically any community such as Tekisan uh, or Dor to the extent that we know uh, Megiddo. But at Megiddo, we can turn uh, uh, point out that we have a number of architectural features that present, represent most probably uh, political and economics and social structures within this community. One, for example, would be the presence of a, albeit small residency, um, which continues the palace traditions of the late Bronze Age. We have uh, the tradition of architecturally, but also in its uh, political importance of uh, small uh, sanctuaries, <clears throat> usually situated at the highest point of the site. You can see the temple at Megiddo still being very much in the late Bronze Age tradition. And we have next to our uh, uh, living quarters of uh, rather modest structures in Megiddo, we have now here also pat patrician houses, again, uh, referring, I'm referring here to a study by Ayele Gebor and Ilan Sharon, which have uh, looked into these structures. And we can see here a number of parallels and continuations with the earlier late Bronze Age site, going back to houses such as the house of Oteno. Um, just want to mention that we have possibly a very similar structure in this society as we had in Ugarit uh, in a nutshell, if I want, uh, if you um, would accept that expression, and uh, maybe a continuation also of the patrimonial structure that this kingdom and its society had. For example, if um, the king uh, of Bi uh, Byblos uh, in the Wenamun papyrus is turning to Lebanon and says to, uh, if I shout into the mountains, the, uh, this, the cedar beams will come down. It uh, very much resembles the control that uh, a Ugaritic king would have had over his resources. Then uh, the king's uh, uh, economy as an Ugarit might be still in RNH1 be flanked by these petition houses. Um, and uh, I just want to remind you that Otenu, the, uh, the wealthy petition in Ugarit, uh, was in charge of uh, having uh, uh, exchanging letters of political importance with uh, Pharaoh Omerim Ta. So uh, these uh, petitions have an important political role and economic role. And in the back looms the, uh, the question uh, of the development of so-called private trade and private maritime uh, enterprises. And uh, the patrimonial model would question the uh, dichotomy between the public and the private aspects of these enterprises. I can obviously only very shortly refer to this. So the Phoenician process includes then also the important finds at Dor which shows that in this period of the late 11th and, the, uh, and even in the early 11th century, uh, uh, cities, uh, these communities, especially the community of Dor, was still in very <coughs> intense exchange with Egypt, which always provided a very important uh, market in the background uh, throughout uh, the RNH1 in the emergence of early Phoenicia. So early Phoenicia would then be, in this very first stage, um, a network of small coastal communities being uh, inter, in, in interaction with each other in specific forms of um, uh, uh, exchange. And I'm referring specifically now to the late 11th and the 10th century, and I would uh, call the exchange of these communities, as I said earlier, as interrelated, decentralized, and multi-directional networks of these communities with each other 
and with Egypt in the background, especially with Egypt much more than in the second part of the 11th century. Um, uh, then early Phoenician communities, I, I would um, uh, rather than, than identifying them ethnically, I would rather identify them in a, in a, uh, as a, um, communities with a similar um, political economy, <clears throat> which would mean they mirror each one, uh, uh, other, one another, in the political economies, in the, in the ways that conscious and unconscious practices of production, reproduction of the material culture, in the habitus connected with urban or small towns, I should probably say, in the habitus connected with urban and architectural expressions, the ceramics and symbols, rather than ethnical identity. Now, I think that these practices which connect them, in fact, and which begin uh, the Phoenician process, that these practices were mutually recognizable, but they did not imply political unity or integrated ethnicity. The purpose of this paper here today is then, of course, to discuss these practices and um, uh, identify them as stages in the development of uh, Phoenician, uh, um, the Phoenician process. And I, I would rather refer this now to a Phoenician process than a Phoenician identity, which <clears throat> now I think one of the most important events then is that in the 10th century, many of these communities get destroyed and disappear. Among them also uh, the excavations that I'm conducting together with David Schloon of the University of Chicago Oriental Institute and uh, Professor Bernd Schipper of the Humboldt University. Uh, our site gets uh, destroyed while Dor go, uh, survives for a while. Other cities uh, or city states or towns of city states disappear in the same process. And uh, this is uh, not a single event, but uh, throughout the 10th century, around the middle of the 10th century, many of these former um, um, uh, urban sites uh, disappear. And we see that uh, two or uh, at least two or three uh, political units uh, emerge from this destruction. One is the kingdom of Israel eventually in the end of the 10th century and the, then especially under the uh, Omri dynasty in the, late, in the 9th century. We see the development of Aram Damascus on the more or less on the territories of former kingdom Geshur. And the third power is, uh, according to what we understand, is the kingdom of Tyre. Now, if these three survive the, the destruction of the first um, uh, form of early Phoenicia, and we are now heading towards the second uh, stage of Phoenician uh, in, in the Phoenician process, if these three survive the destructions, one may assume that they had also a hand in some responsibility in this destruction. And what they did was they uh, erased most of the communities which formed of the network that I've earlier mentioned. A door survives for a while, but also gets uh, in, in included in the kingdom of Israel in the ninth century, which leaves in along the coast only two uh, kingdoms, um, two polity polities uh, in, in the southern Levant, which is the kingdom of Tyre and the kingdom of Israel, of which the kingdom of Tyre is the one who in, uh, is uh, uh, active in uh, economic exchange, maritime exchange. As soon as Dor gets um, uh, included in the uh, kingdom of Israel, uh, the excavators of Dor, uh, uh, most of all Ayelet Gibor, has shown that it loses all its economic impact and its, and its economic importance because the kingdom of Israel apparently does not really inter, uh, engage in maritime trade and uh, the kingdom of Tyre is the uh, surviving part in this. Then more than that, there is the discussion whether the kingdom of, Is uh, of Tyre also expanded into what we now call the Southern Phoenicia in the sense of the Akko Plain. And uh, this is a debate which we need to continue, which we need also to research to what extent then in the 10th maybe, or then uh, more certainly in the ninth century, the Aquaplane became part of an expansion of Tyra. This is by no means clear and has to be uh, more investigated. This would then form the second part, second stage in what uh, I uh, suggest is the Phoenician process 
in which now communities which do which are outside of Lebanon are not more anymore a part of classical Phoenicia. Now Phoenicia really contracts to uh, the communities in uh, Lebanon itself. So in the first stage, it included communities in the southern Levant in Israel. Now it doesn't anymore. Now, the third stage, if I may say so, seems to be a, a very disturbing and not quite clear uh, thing or process. In the third stage, uh, and um, I propose uh, to call this the eighth century, the third stage, uh, we have a very uh, a process that we don't really understand. It's, it is the time when the kingdom of Tyre is at the peak of its political and economic expansion. It founds uh, uh, its colonies in the Western Mediterranean, but we hardly have any site in the eighth century in the Akko plain. Uh, Achzif, Kabri, Akko, Kisan, uh, Tel Abu Hawam are virtually non-existent or have very, very poor finds. Only at the site of Shikmona and Rosh Zayit, we do have archaeological finds, but they are very often connected only with one building or two. So what's going on in the eighth century, which seems to be such an important century for uh, the uh, Phoenicians? Uh, what is happening here in what we thought was the southern backyard of Tyre? It's a very important question. Of course, there have been uh, suggestions already by, by our colleague uh, Eran Arieh, who uh, thinks that we are witnessing the expansion of the kingdom of Israel. But this is by no means uh, a question that we have clearly solved by this point. Um, what we are doing is continuing our research. Uh, uh, Asav has recently excavated in Tel Kabri. I was part of the earlier expedition. And the news is that right here in our storage, we have still uh, a lot of unpublished Phoenician material from Cabri, which I hope to put out now. And of course, then we have our excavation at Tel Kisan, a new old excavation begun by uh, British and French expeditions before us. And David Schloon, uh, Bernd Schipper, and I am looking forward to go as soon as possible back to the field and address some of these questions of what we call the Phoenician process. Thank you very much, and may ear. Uh, best congratulations uh, to the publication of your book, and we hope that we will all be part of this larger discussion and uh, Mazal Tov. So now, thanks. Thank you very much, Munar, uh, and I apologize for the previous disruption, but it happens, as uh, all of you know. Uh, our second lecturer, Aren Meyer, is a professor of archaeology and head of the Institute of Archaeology the Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology of Bar Ilan University. Aren has directed the Tel Safi Gat archaeological project for the last 25 years and co-directs the Minerva Center for the relations between Israel and Aram in biblical times. Aren is also director of the Ing Burener Center for Jerusalem Studies at Bar Ilan University and co-editor of the Israel Exploration Journal. Aren is the author of numerous publications on the Bronze and Iron Ages of the Southern Levant, and I would like him to take the talk, please. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, it's very nice to be able to join this uh, happy occasion. Um, I, first of all, I want to join everybody else in congratulating uh, Mayor. Um, uh, I was um, had the I was fortunate enough to read his, his uh, book, and I think it's excellent. And since it's based on his PhD, I'm going to, of course, uh, kudos to his advisors as well. And based on Mayer's insights and attempts to define uh, the Phoenician cultural identity, I wanted to move beyond Phoenicia and, say, and share some thoughts, deliberations, questions, doubts, perhaps, on the issues of relating to identity in archaeology and in general and in the Ar Iron Age Southern Levant. And um, for the last uh, close to 10 years, I've been uh, thinking and writing a lot about the issues of uh, identity in archaeology, starting from, um, from Philistine identity and, and how it's uh, reflected in the archaeological record and going farther. And, and to a large extent, I sort of feel that I'm sitting on a, on a branch in a tree and I'm slowly 
sawing away um, at the branch, uh, being on the wrong side. Uh, and in, a, um, in an article which is about to be published, which I'll, uh, I'm very, very uh, skeptical about a lot of the um, discussions on identity uh, on is early Israel in gen and specifically, but in general, I think I have finally um, cut the branch and I've fallen to the ground uh, very painfully. Um, and um, what I think, uh, and I'm speaking, I'm, I think I'm speaking, castigating myself and, and many of us in the, in the field of archaeology, is how we uh, deal with identity in the archaeological record. And uh, I'm not aiming it at Mayer, I'm aiming it at myself and all of us. And I think it's time to take a, a very, very um, um, strong view uh, on how we relate to identity in archaeology. And uh, I want to start with a couple of um, uh, issues uh, in general. So first of all, it's very important to remember that identity is not a thing. You don't have identity. You, your, your identity is a process that you're continuously going through. It's not a static thing. Um, and because of that, it's not something that one has, but it's something that one does. And that's a very, very important thing. Now, um, when we start to talk about what identification is, it's important to remember that identification is an interaction between relationships of both similarity and of difference. And um, an individual and collective identity are as much an interactual product of external identification by others as of internal uh, self-identification. And it's wrong to put the emphasis on only one aspect and not the other. And most importantly, identity is not static. It's produced and reproduced and changed uh, in discourse and in very practical and often very material consequences of identification. Now, when we look at how identity is dealt with in archaeology, I think I can point out several issues, which I'm sure are not new for many of you, but nevertheless, I think it's very, very important to point them out. First of all, I think when we talk about identity, there's too much emphasis on ethnicity. Ethnicity is one type of identity. There are many other identities that groups have and, and, and people have. And it's important to re not to throw on the wayside all kinds of other types of identity, which perhaps have reflection in the archeological uh, record. Um, I think many of us in a very, very, um, uh, it's, we come from our mother, uh, from our mother's milk, we're stuck in the so-called Kulturkreislehre paradigm. I'll talk about this in a moment, uh, which is a, um, a old, uh, more than a hundred years old paradigm, which I think we're very much stuck in it. And it's very comfortable to be there, but I think we have to be very aware of the problem. Um, another issue is too many of us are unfamiliar with updated social theory on identity. We, we base what we write on this, on things that were written sometimes 10, 20, 30, or um, for example, um, the very often quoted text by Barth, Ethnic Groups and Boundaries, came out in 1969. And they, not too long ago, celebrated the 50th anniversary of its publication. And this is very often related to as more or less the final say on, on, on the matter and on ethnicity. And for example, the emphasis on borders. And we have to remember that things are developing and we have to be aware of them. And very often, um, you see people who quote the theory, but then practice the opposite. And this is something that we have to be very aware of. And, and last on the, for this slide is this problem that we, that we turn to, and Mayer also talked about this in his book, there is basically a tyranny of the text. That means that we're so dependent on the text to define um, identity. Um, let's see, Rosanna, you're making noise here. Um, okay. Uh, um, 
Um, okay, so there it was our nice off. Thank you. Um, and general, and this this tyranny of the text brings out is that on the one hand, when you have the text, it dictates our archaeological understanding, and then um, when we don't have the text, we're, we sometimes flounder away without a, a clear direction. Now, what is this? Um, when I talked about Kulturkreis uh, there. This is a um, concept which was developed by the, the famous or rather infamous uh, archaeologist Gustav Kosina. Uh, Kosina, part of his, um, his general method of Seidlung's uh, archaeology, in which he tried to define how we can um, talk about um, uh, arche archaeological evidence. One second, is there a problem, Mayor? Can I go on? Mayor, can I go on? Yes, no problem. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Everybody hears me. Um, yeah. Uh, and basically, uh, he developed what's known as the Cosina Axiom, and which is translated into English, strictly outlined, sharply defined, bounded regions of archaeological culture, necessarily coincide with certain ethnic or tribal areas. Now, um, bluntly speaking, this is what is called the POTS equal peoples uh, approach. And even though this has been discussed extensively and shown to be outmoded, as we will see, many of us, and, and at times all of us are still very deeply in this approach um, when we deal with archaeological remains and the arche and, uh, and the and identity, and this is not only a problem in the Iron Age Levant, and I'm bringing here two examples from um, Iron Age and medieval Europe, uh, in which we're talking about um, uh, the the, con the problems of identity and the archaeological records, and we'll start with a. Uh, quote from Popa, um, if the scope of archaeological research is to obtain an insight into the identity constructions of Iron Age people, as suggested by the material evidence, then we need not to be fixed on one particular type of identity, which may or may not actually be present in the archaeological record. Rather, allow for all possible scenarios to unfold and pick the ones that seem most plausible. This implies a 180 degree turn in the relationship between identity concepts and the material record. One should not categorize the material record based on some large ethnic identities that we assume people share, but rather reconstruct past identities based on the material record patterns. Now, what this means is that we very often base these large ethnic identities on on, on textual sources. And if we move on to the next um, uh, quote, this is by Susan Hackenbeck, who discusses issues of identity in early medieval Europe. And she says, studies on, of ethnicity in the early medieval period have relied heavily on a literal reading of historical sources, creating a self-referencing circular argument. The sources are thought to provide a fragment of facts and dates into which archaeological evidence can be fitted. Fragments of information gained from historical sources are taken out of context and used to identify the movements and settlement areas of, of the barbarian peoples. Distribution maps of specific artifact types then apparently identify these areas on the ground. The next step is to identify the ethnicity of individuals by making a connection between these artifacts and the identity of those who are buried with them. Once the tribal areas be complicated, be populated with people, these people then turn fully clothed into the actors mentioned in the historical sources. And making a uh, scheme, which uh, which ba is based on Hackenbeck's uh, scheme, um, you can look, you start with literal reading of the historical sources, extrapolation of e ethnic identities, interpretation of distribution maps to fit these ethnic territories, identification of artifacts as being ethnically significant, identification of ethnicity and individual, and the, 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 the and this circle goes on. Now, take this out of early medieval Europe, 
place this in the Iron Age Levant and biblical sources or other sources, this is exactly what we more or less are all doing all the time. And this is very problematic from, um, from many aspects. Um, now, if we go to the Iron Age Levant, so we very often have simplistic distinctions that we can identify large groups, Israelites, Judites, Phoenicians, uh, Philistines, etc. Um, very often in a simplistic manner, very often in a simplistic understanding of, of the relevant text, um, we, we map out very broad and very monolithic and at times static uh, situations. Um, we have unidimensional identity differentiation. That means we mainly talk of ethnicities or cultures. We very rarely deal with um, other aspects of identity. And of course, the overemphasis of biblical oriented paradigm. That means taking a text which is based on um, a, a collated edited text of, of, of sometimes portions are hundreds of years after the actual periods which they supposedly um, reflect and trying to interpret backwards using uh, materials that are clearly of ideological um, um, uh, origin. And we're basically using written sources in a very, very simplistic manner. So let's point out some important points. Material culture often does not equal identity. We have the habit of doing exactly the opposite, of assuming that it does. Um, by the way, again and again, um, studies have shown it's also for language. Language does not necessarily correlate with identity, not ethnicity and not others. Sometimes it does, often it doesn't. Um, identity in the archaeological remains is best seen not based on dispersal of certain objects, not based on maps, but through differences in praxis and in particular technology. This is something that's coming out more and more in research is very, very specific technological praxis on the day-to-day -day level within groups is perhaps one of the best ways to differentiate between groups. And why is this so? Is because many of the things of daily praxis that people have in their groups are things that are learned from an early age and they become sort of an automatic aspect. And, when you, and through this, you can perhaps at times differentiate between groups but you can use the same type of object in different groups. And that same object can be made in the different groups using different technology. So this is true for cooking. This is true for um, pottery production and many other aspects uh, in daily life. Um, and one of the things that many people are talking, many uh, scholars are talking about in, in social theory is to start talking of communities of practice and communities of belonging within these small scale groups. And these perhaps are how we may be able to start getting an idea of identity in the archeological record based on the, um, on the archeological finds. Another very, very important aspect uh, to think about is what's known as nested identities. And that we all have many, many identities um, they're not all one in, in, within the other as the babushka dolls, but many of them overlap in different ways with different groups and peoples. But we have to always remember that we uh, have complex uh, nested identities in any group, in any person, in any culture, in any period. Um, and for example, and I've written about this several times, is there's been a lot of discussion um, in the Iron Age about can we define the various groups living in the uh, area between the southern coastal plain uh, or so-called Philistia through the Shvela, the Judean foothills up into the highlands? And the, and the, the simplistic interpretation that I've suggested very often is the Philistines are here, including at Gap, where I work. Uh, in the middle, you have Canaanites. And in the highlands, you have the Judites and Israelites. And 
Again and again, I've pointed out, and others have pointed out, that this is much more complex. And I've actually suggested, why aren't you moving, um, that perhaps we have to look at uh, a continuum. That means you don't necessarily have clear-cut borders. You don't necessarily have a situation where people know exactly who is where right up past a certain point. And there is a continuity and complex overlapping in the identities, the various types of identities that exist in, in this region. And this would go for ethnic identities and other identities as well. And another no less important aspect to remember is that while we very often look at these identities as very clear cut, um, they can be very shifting. And an example to this is um, political identities. And if we accept as most um, uh, social theorists believe that almost all um, pre-modern societies are societies which have patron-client relationships. That means that you have a charismatic leader who controls or influences um, smaller scale leaders below him. And this is so for the Iron Age as well. These small scale le leaders can shift uh, their allegiances over time. And the same group in one uh, year can be affiliated with Jerusalem and the next year being affiliated with Ashkelon, but still have, to, by and large, the same uh, material culture. And so this is another example of how these uh, aspects are complex. So if I may finish uh, this rather, um, um, I would say, problematic view of can we identify uh, identities in our archaeology, let me say that, first of all, I think it is possible. I think, yes, but very cautiously. And I think we must be aware of more than one identity in any given situation. We must have a very broad range of criteria, both material and textual, to start talking about the various identities. It's constantly changing even if the material culture stays the same, it doesn't mean that the, identi the identity uh, has not. We have to start thinking in small scale of community of practice and communities of belonging. Technology, Shana Paratoire is a powerful tool. And most importantly, stop from bottom up and not from uh, uh, top down and start looking at the uh, differentiations between small groups and then start building uh, from there. And of course, be very uh, be, beware of the broad generations, which are often textually based, and of course, very often based on texts that are much later. So uh, I'm still trying to figure out my identity. And as I said, I cut the, um, the, the, the branch off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oren. I'm sure there will be some question for your uh, revolutionary talks. <laughs> and now I would like to ask uh, our third lecturer, uh, Aaron Brody, uh, to provide his talk. Aaron is a professor of Bible and Archaeology and director of the Bade Museum at the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. He has excavated primarily at harbor sites in Israel, including Tel Nami, Ashkelon, Do, and Tel Ako, and has participated in other archeological projects uh, in Israel and in California. His research interests include household archeology, span archeology span of religion, um, economy, identity, and ethnicity, and post-colonialism and maritime and deep water archeology. span Recent publication uh, focused on household religion, metallurgy, and integrational trade at Telenaste from holdings in the Bade and Rockefeller museums. Uh, earlier research focused on the specialized religion of Canaanite and Phoenician seafarer, and I think the topic of the talk will be somehow related to the earlier research. Aaron, please. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to extend my congratulations to, uh, to Mayer on the uh, publication of his book. Um, it was a joy to, uh, to read it, uh, and it joins a uh, a recent pantheon, I would say, of um, renewed interest in publications uh, on, the, on the Phoenicians, so Kola Kavod. Um, Mayor asked me to, to zoom in on the 
uh, aspects of religion that he discussed in his book. Um, so that'll be the focus of my topic today. Um, and uh, instead of, you know, sort of getting into the weeds, I really wanted to lift up um, Mayer's definition uh, of religion and cult uh, and discuss some of the um, aspects uh, of it uh, as he um, covered in his book. Um, and then perhaps uh, offer a slightly different way of framing some of these questions. So here we have a, a quote from the beginning of that chapter on page 140. <clears throat> it says, before exploring the various aspects of religion and cult of the Phoenicians, perhaps it would be wise to define these two terms. To my understanding, in its most basic form, an ancient religion is a system of beliefs maintained by an official authority via a complex hierarchy of clergy. In the ancient Near East, the uppermost position of this hierarchy was often occupied by the monarch or other members of the royal house. Cult is the sum of the rituals and practices performed as part of the worship in this religion or in the religion. In religion, the connection with the deity or deities is often indirect and is facilitated by the clergy through the cult. However, <clears throat> besides the official manifestations of cult practices set by the clergy, cult often has a popular element influenced by various traditions that, are at, that at times can be indirect contrast to the laws of that religion. So I wanted to take my time um, and just push back against this definition a little bit, uh, thinking about these different topics that I have highlighted here, uh, which include personal piety, household and family religion, community worship that is performed outside of official locations, um, rituals performed on board ships, uh, which I've written about and um, Mayor also covered. Uh, and then finally, tombs and burials at loci, uh, as loci uh, of religion. Um, and in some ways, I mean, I think like our previous speakers, of course, here, I'm, I'm basing my thoughts on some of my earlier research, which were necessarily focused on Phoenicians, but I've been working on this uh, site, Tel en Nazbe, which is located north of Jerusalem. But some of the, the elements of thoughts about the religious practices at that site are influencing my, my comments here uh, today. Um, because I, I think, Mayor, in this very definition, and I know religion is very difficult to define, um, but the problem is that uh, this definition doesn't really allow for um, religion outside of the official sphere. Um, and as we all know, with these ancient cultures and with many modern traditional cultures, religion is not really separated from other elements of identity, um, uh, as Aaron was just talking about. Uh, and so to make it only official, to make it only, you know, sort of the realm of the priesthood and the royalty disassociates religion from the rest of these ancient cultures, uh, you know, most of which, I mean, for, for the, the social um, structure of most of these cultures, of course, the vast majority, 85 to 95% of the population, you know, was not part of the elite. Uh, and so I'd like to sort of redirect some of the, um, the thoughts that you put down on paper, uh, putting religion kind of back into the, the public square, so to speak. Um, and uh, so just sort of thinking first about ideas around uh, personal piety. Again, what, which I would, I would define as being religious, not just cultic. Um, so here I have some uh, archaeological examples. Uh, and also, in, in some ways, you can think about 
this following up on some of the themes that have already come out from our other speakers uh, in that oftentimes what we have preserved um, or focused on for ancient religions, not just Phoenician, but others, uh, first and foremost comes from our ancient textual sources. Uh, and those sources, again, tend to uh, bias our thoughts, not just about what is religion, but what, a, what it meant to be, you know, sort of part of that proper religion. And I feel like one of the things that archeology span is really good for is giving the alternate, alternate views, right? But we have to kind of structure our thoughts to fill those baskets. So one example of that is, is this notion of personal piety. Um, and this probably comes out most directly. Uh, of course, we have from textual mentions of the theophoric names of, of ancient Phoenicians. This was true throughout the, the Near East uh, as well. But oftentimes the, the naming of a newborn child was considered a, a form of blessing. Uh, it was a prayer. It was a religious act and something that an individual held throughout uh, her or his life. Now, in terms of archaeology, we have um, what usually gets sort of put under the category of small finds. I believe you referred to this appropriately as apotropaic um, objects. Um, I just chose some of the fancy ones here uh, to put up on the slides. Um, but we, you know, we might all, as moderns even, relate to this. Um, folks who might wear a, a mezuzah around their neck um, or a Star of David or um, a cross uh, or a crescent moon or the, the you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are religious aspects uh, you know, of an individual nature, um, but I would say uh, have an importance that may be, you know, uh, even as great, you know, as worship going on uh, in, in a temple. And especially because, well, we don't really know about who was allowed in those official spaces, temple spaces, um, but and especially for Phoenicia. Uh, but the notion is, at least for um, the ancient, the first temple uh, in Jerusalem, that it really was not a space for common people, not to enter at least. Uh, and so that, again, uh, pushes back a, a little bit against some of those notions put forth. So moving from the individual to the, the sort of next bigger unit, the, the household or family religion. Um, this is a topic that's becoming uh, more and more um, looked into uh, for, for the ancient Near East. Uh, I think a little bit less for uh, Phoenicia itself, probably again, uh, as you detailed, because of the scattered nature of the evidence that we have. Um, but I would, I would also um, urge our, our audience and, uh, for, um, you know, again, just the field in general to really uh, begin to focus on, you know, thinking about what was going on in these ordinary houses, the houses of more common people, again, outside of the temple, outside of palace um, contexts. Uh, because, um, you know, the, with this habitus, uh, as was lifted up in, in earlier talks, the kinds of things that uh, are informally, not really instructed, but just ingrained uh, within new generations growing up in these households. Uh, and again, I would put this in the realm uh, of religion uh, and not just cult. Um, so, and I understand the, the difficulties. Um, up until recently, we had very little evidence uh, from the uh, the Iron Age or the Persian period uh, for uh, Phoenician houses, um, but it's it's beginning to be um, corrected. Uh, and so the examples I've lifted up here are for, are from the diaspora, um, from uh, from Sicily uh, and North Africa. But uh, again, I would uh, urge us all to think about the 
uh, because it, it wasn't just, you know, actions, cultic actions or ritual actions that were taking place in houses um, at the family level, but it also was, was religion. It's, it's not like these folks without any kind of official uh, present, let alone, you know, nearby, uh, weren't, uh, you know, thinking, they weren't just acting, they were also thinking about um, uh, and embodying uh, aspects uh, of their um, religion in their, literally in their daily lives. And some of that was taking place within the privacy uh, of their own households, again, well outside the, um, the realm of uh, official religion, although presumably religious officials <clears throat> and royalty also had household practices uh, as well. So moving on to my next category, thinking a little bit about uh, community worship, uh, again, sort of outside of the um, official places of, of temple locations. Um, we have, um, again, mo probably mostly from, from text, but ideas that natural places like mountaintops and uh, groves of trees, um, springs, uh, caves were important locations for uh, either personal piety, uh, family or household religion, uh, but also community worship uh, as well. Um, and then one could even think about the evidence that you've presented very nicely uh, about the Marzeach uh, or even the, the Tophets, these areas of uh, child sacrifice, uh, as being related to elements of community worship. Um, and again, I would, I would sort of put these aspects in the realm of, of religion. It's not just the rituals that were taking place, but the, the thoughts and, uh, that led to the actions. Um, and so again, just sort of expanding that, that definition that we have. And some, I just have some visual examples uh, from the, the greater Phoenician region here. Uh, of course, a topic near and dear to my own heart, uh, rituals performed on board ships. Again, the, the ship itself uh, is, is um, I would say, uh, and I have said, uh, a place of uh, religious thought and, and cultic action uh, or ritual action. But again, it really is outside of the, the realm of officialdom. Um, and I just uh, put in some examples here of this tomb painting from a little bit earlier from the, the tomb of Kenamon of these, uh, uh, I guess they're, they're Canaanite or Levantine uh, seafarers arriving uh, in Egypt. And then here's a, an altar from a Phoenician shipwreck uh, excavated off of the uh, southeastern coast of, of Spain. Um, but I, I think that, uh, again, few examples, but that these lift up this notion that, again, religion could happen and did happen, um, you know, just, just about anywhere, and especially in places that were not officially sanctioned. Um, and again, if we put it sort of in the, in the realm of identity, um, it uh, as an aspect of, of one's identity, not separated out from uh, other elements, um, then this makes perfect sense. Uh, in order, you know, sailors, in order to uh, protect themselves uh, and to ensure safe voyage uh, and personal safety uh, and success, of course, um, continued their relationship with their deities uh, away from land. Uh, and we find meager evidence, but we find it um, from uh, shipwrecks and then depictions of ships uh, as well. Uh, and then finally, and, and you lifted up this, this evidence too, we know that um, the, not only, of course, uh, are uh, burials and tombs considered to be a, a locus of 
religious uh, practices, but there were ceremonies that took place. Um, you can think about the, the uh, discoveries from, uh, you know, sort of just outside or, or the entryways to some of the Axiv tombs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, many parallels uh, in, in Lebanon. Um, and again, it's, it's difficult to sort of pinpoint, but there may have been um, times of, for instance, anniversary when the uh, grave sites became loci uh, of religious practice um, uh, besides the actual burial event, things like that. Um, so again, um, I would say that um, these, these sorts of ideas and practices really fall outside of the, the realm of uh, official religion, but uh, form an important element um, of these ancient ideas uh, and practices. Uh, and I would just also lift up that all, all of these um, subsets that I've uh, delineated, uh, as you've shown in your book, um, are um, almost, they're, they're really uh, best gotten to through the archeology. span um, It's the archeological remains, the, the moot, or the mute, excuse me, not moot, um, remains that, that really speak volumes uh, to numerous aspects of, you know, this sort of unofficial religion. Um, to use a, a modern parallel, at, at least for the, for the US um, where I'm based, um, you know, these are sort of aspects of the religion of the 99%, not the 1%. And so I think as scholars, and especially as archeologists, um, we need to flip the script in some ways uh, and to, to let this um, you know, material evidence uh, begin to you know, really speak for itself, uh, but we have to frame it in ways um, that uh, you know, really centers uh, its importance. So again, just uh, in conclusion and, and uh, congratulations, um, it's wonderful um, to, um, to have your book out um, and to be able to, um, to turn to it. Uh, religion is of course a notoriously difficult to define. I myself didn't try and do it in this talk, but, um, but focusing the definition on systems of belief maintained by an official authority via a complex hierarchy of clergy leaves the majority of ancient evidence you've presented in your book out of the realm of religion. The archeological finds you detail more often pertain to the lived religion of the Phoenicians, which in my <clears throat> view is as much in it of as much importance, if not more than the official religion maintained by the clergy. Material remnants of rituals related to personal piety household and family religion, community worship, maritime religion, and the ritual uh, care for the dead, and of course for the living as well. The evidence beyond the sanctioned religious beliefs and ritual practices bring a richness, complexity, and humanity to the topic, a subject typically ridiculed and demeaned by the authors of various passages in the Hebrew Bible uh, and classical texts but a vital element of ancient Phoenician identity. So thank you. Um, and I look forward to further dialogue. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, I think that before uh, Mayor's concluding remark, we can have some time for questions for any of the lecturer. Uh, you can do it via the chat. You can do it via the microphone. So if you, anybody has something to ask, now it's the time. Nothing. Everything's clear. Yeah, we're still clear. <laughs> or nothing. <laughs> so maybe I'll... Um... Aaron, Aaron would like to ask something. Yeah, I, I just want to, because <clears throat> identity is such an important element of the book uh, and of um, Aaron Mayer's talk. 
I just wanted to to lift up also that, and I I fully agree with the with the comments provided that you know identity is not ethnicity and ethnicity is not identity, and that's something that's very important to hammer home, um, <clears throat> and that one is I mean from from my view and also social theorist view, identity is sort of a it's a, it's a package of, of elements that make up an individual or make up a group, right? And so I, it, I'm not uh, so out there that I don't believe that ethnicity didn't, didn't exist, but I would, I would define it as an element of identity, right? We all, and also totally agree with Aaron uh, in that, um, you know, I, identity is, and, and its elements like ethnicity, uh, is changeable, uh, and also I would say is is situational. So in a given day, depending on I'll just use myself as an example, depending on with whom I'm interacting, elements of my identity might change or shift. It doesn't mean I'm not the same person. Uh, it just means that you know we as individuals and we as groups of individuals are complex, and so I think those kinds of notions. That sort of changeability also <clears throat> uh, helps us understand, you know, some of those maps that were put up, where there really weren't fixed boundary, you know, there there weren't fixed boundaries. Um, it was it was uh, there were these sort of transition zones, right? Um, and I, I think that all of those are very important concepts and actually help us understand uh, our material. Uh, even better, uh, since our material isn't in fixed packages, right? We make those those walls ourselves. So, okay. Anybody else would like to comment or to ask a question? Aaron, I see that you are holding yourself, so maybe. No, I, I'm, I have no problem. <laughs> no, they have to read my, you'll have to read my article when it comes out, the, the extended yeah. version. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes. I mean, again, I mean, we're all, we're are mostly archaeologists, but, um, and I, I also agree about the, the notion about language, right? But one of the interesting things is, of course, the, the, the small bits of, of linguistic evidence that we do have also show a relationship between, you know, many of the, the ancient people groups that are, you know, named in, in, our, in our texts. They are, you know, oftentimes dialectal relationships. So again, in some ways, if you think about dialects, that also helps us kind of map our, our notions, right? These are, are people who could speak to each other uh, in their native tongue and still understand each other, right? Um, and so, you know, but if you say Hebrew and you say Phoenician, it sounds very distinct. Uh, and there were distinctions, but I would say dialectal ones. And I, I think it's, in some ways, that's also a kind of interesting way of kind of framing the you know the the mute remains as well that you know these were interrelated groups they were we know that they were marrying among each other um and that it was it, it was all it was all much more fluid i think than many of our our and in some ways the the ancient texts part of their purpose was to make these barriers firmer right and again, that's sort of the official view, right? We want to be different from our neighbors. Um, and so if we put it in writing, if we make it a law, it helps to firm up what we believe, even if that's not the practice on the ground. So I like the, def there's a, I forgot who said this, but someone once said that the definition of a Phoenician is an Aramean who can swim. Uh, so, so uh, <laughs> So I think a lot and a Jew, of our, and a Jew can drink. <laughs> so a lot, I think a lot of our our definitions are based on uh, all kinds of conceptions. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is something. Any other comments? 
man. Yeah, I was just saying um, this is something that I um, sort of address in my book um, uh, using one of the um, <laughs> Freud's one of Freud's uh, theories of of um, neighboring uh, societies or neighboring. Uh, countries, or you can call it whatever you want, neighboring communities, and it's called the narcissism of neighboring communities, which um, if, if you take an example from two kibbutzes, uh, uh, Owen knows what I'm talking about, if you take Bet Alpha and you take the nearby uh, kibbutz, they're basically on the same ground, but they hate each other and you can't call one the other. So looking from the outside on these two communities, you'd say they're exactly the same, but they obviously see differences uh, between them. So yeah, this is just one of the things that shows how complex identity is. Good. Okay, any other comment before? I, I, I think there was a question on, I think there was a question on chat for Aaron. Okay, so please go ahead. From Mark me, Aaron, not Aaron, Aaron. Ah, okay. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, uh, conference. Uh, uh, the topic for me is very interesting because I'm interesting for the relation between the Thracian and Phoenicians. Uh, there are more than 300 stone ship uh, answers in Bulgarian museums. Uh, I think there uh, had the context. Many, uh, there is archaeological material too. Uh, I have a question. Do you think that the Thracians had, uh, a Phoenician had uh, con contact with the uh, Thracian in the North Asian islands. The contact between Thracians and Phoenicians uh, in the North Asian islands. Tassos, Lemnos. I, I, if the question is for me, I have, I have no clue. So I, I will open it up to the, to the group, um, and would love to hear uh, an answer. I personally don't know any specific uh, connections of that area with the Phoenicians, although. I'm sure there were some sort of trade relations or anything of that nature. Maybe I could jump in for a second. Because <laughs> uh, uh, um, I think that the uh, Phoenician materials in Greece and the Aegean are very badly understudied. And just recently, John Papadopoulos and others who were excavated yes. <laughs> in Metone in Greece have indeed uh, found Amphoros just as the one I have behind me. Yes, uh, I saw and, uh, that that I'm way. sure that we only start to look for these, uh, then we will find them. Thank you. I can add that we have the other way around. We have material from the Northern Aegean in uh, as early as the 8th century. We have uh, Amphorae from uh, Lesbos and the Trods, and also in the 7th century, and uh, obviously in the Persian period as well. So, Do you know in very rich Thracian burials, aristocratic burials, we find a lot of beads of Phoenician must. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. The ritual is uh, Thracian, but in the tomb the, we find beads, Phoenician beads, I and masks. Uh, the burial are from the end of fifth, uh, fourth century BC. Mm. 
Okay, thank you very much. Any other comment from the crowd? So, uh, May, without further ado, uh, your concluding remarks, please. All right. Um, can you guys see me fine? Yeah. Okay, so um, good evening, everyone here, here with us on Zoom and uh, the people watching on uh, YouTube. I'd like to uh, thank everyone that was involved in organizing and producing this event. Um, Shelley, first of all, Dr. Zerpsion, and the uh, stage for the history of the land of Israel and the Jewish people for hosting this uh, seminar. Um, Professor Safi Landa and Professor Adi Eli for your kind words, and um, of course, Professor Owen Tal for chairing this event. I'm, I'm truly honored. I can honestly say I never expected to have <laughs> such an event prior to my retirement. So um, again, th thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Um, of course, I'm also uh, extremely grateful to our uh, esteemed speakers who took the time to uh, appear here today and give us these uh, wonderful uh, talks and for actually reading my book. <laughs> I, um, I couldn't have imagined a better dream team to comment on. And um, I really thank you for your uh, thoughtful remarks. Um, and of course, I would also like to thank uh, our audience for being with us um, without actually being with us. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have preferred to actually participate in such an event uh, in a less virtual setting, but um, this platform also uh, has some benefits because it allows us to reach out to a much wider audience. Now, before I... Um, address the um, speakers. Um, I'd like to take just a few minutes of your time for some um, personal comments. Um, this book that we're discussing uh, was supposed to be printed in late 2019, hence the publication date uh, printed in it. Um, but the publishing house ran into some delays and uh, soon the holiday season began. And then um, they asked if it could be delayed in, by a few months. And uh, then it would have been um, um, published or printed in uh, early 2020. I agreed. But then, as you all know, the, the pandemic struck and nothing was uh, normal again until recently at least here in Israel when we're finally starting to go back to normal uh, and the uh, two three months delay turned to almost a year so um, and the book actually came out by late uh, 2020. Now um, something else happened in the beginning of uh, 2020, uh, just a month or so before the COVID pandemic struck, um, I lost my father. And my father is very much responsible for who I am today. He was the one who instilled in me the importance of education. He was the type of father that disregarded the good grades and biblical studies and history and literature and all the things that I actually like to do and was very displeased with my grades in, in math. He never accepted my excuses that archaeologists don't really need math when we're digging in the dirt. Um, of course we do and to some extent uh, so he was also right in his way although from my point of view about math seems quite common among fellow archaeologists. Um, so I, I dedicated this book to my partner and two daughters. Uh, and in the acknowledgments, I, I thank many people, family included, but I feel obligated 
today to thank my father especially for his um, for his support, for his encouragement throughout my studies, first at Tel Aviv University and even more so during my time in Germany, working on my dissertation. I, um, I always knew I had his back financially, emotionally, which is something that cannot be taken for granted. And um, when other people, you know, my age already had to settle down with actual jobs, I had the luxury of still being a student and doing what I love. And that's something I'm not sure I could have done if I hadn't had, if, if I hadn't had him behind me. So I would like now to at least dedicate this seminar to my father, Hanania Deli, who uh, unfortunately <clears throat> didn't get to see this book in its printed form, but to whom I'm deeply indebted for his role in uh, making it a reality. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, address uh, some of the uh, comments made here. Um, Gunnar, first of all, of course, I agree with uh, almost everything that you said. Um, I take only one small issue with the fact that um, you suggest that um, you can only start seeing a Phoenician or Phoenician identity in the early Iron Age um, while there is such continuity in, in so many aspects of, of, uh, of their life. In fact, these small communities that you talk about that are um, um, maritime active and uh, um, ununified and so on, those are the same communities that you can find in the late Bronze Age uh, and even in the middle Bronze Age. So it's the same socio-political structure that is simply continuing into the Iron Age, obviously with uh, certain differences in you know, technological and, and, um, and other uh, uh, issues, but I find this break, this um, distinction between the proto-Phoenicians or the Kenyanites and the actual Phoenicians a bit artificial. Um, as for the eighth century gap that we uh, talked about before, I, I'm starting to think that it might have something to do with the, uh, the process of, of moving westward. It's possible that full communities of specifically small sites um, uprooted and, and moved westward to uh, better shores. And this is just something I'm starting to um, to think about. Um, as for um, Professor Meir's uh, talk, of course, identity is, is one of the most complex issues in, in both modern and especially ancient societies. Um, and this should and is, um, should be an ongoing discussion. Um, I absolutely agree with your um, suggestion of, of multiple identities. And we can certainly see it with the Phoenicians. Um, you have obviously a familial um, um, identity, your father house. Uh, and then you have a civic identity, which is very strong uh, among the Phoenicians. But I think you also have some sort of broader broader identity, which you can refer to as an ethnic identity. And here, because the Phoenicians chose to, to remain ununited and, and, and very actively tried to uh, separate themselves from other Phoenician uh, city-states, um, politically, religiously, and so on, um, this is where ascription by others comes in handy because 
we have this saying of uh, if, if one person says you're drunk, doesn't necessarily mean you're drunk. If three people say you're drunk, you might be drunk. So if three or more people say that these people as a collective are Phoenician, this is something that we need to uh, take into consideration, especially when we also take into consideration the, um, the concept that I brought earlier, the narcissism of uh, neighboring uh, society. And of course, texts here are extremely problematic and biased, and this is a, um, a common uh, thing uh, when dealing with the Phoenicians because they left us so few original texts. Um, but I find your um, idea of, of the different in praxis uh, interesting because here we can actually see that in one of the hallmarks of the Phoenician society, which is the maritime connection. And here you see uh, a community that revolves around the sea. And this is something very unique to the Phoenician. Uh, so that's um, something that I uh, wanted to bring up. And uh, finally, Professor Brody, thank you so much for your uh, review. Um, of course, religion is uh, or, and was um, part of everyday life in the ancient world, in the ancient Near East. Uh, I think every aspect of society was also somewhat religious. Um, you would uh, blame the gods or thank the gods for every thing that was good or bad in your life. Uh, and um, many actions also involve ritualistic action. I think, I think that uh, what we are both talking about is uh, a bit differences in semantics because I tried to make uh, the distinction between the canonical uh, religion and we certainly know that religion among the Phoenicians like it was in um, other places in the ancient Near East was very much um, a hierarchy of clergy and we see oftentimes that the Phoenician royal family assumes these roles of, of um, high priests and so on. So there is that hierarchy and I'm sure that there was uh, an aspect of, of an official religion that was mainly, uh, mainly revolved around maintaining the uh, the monarchy as the representative of the gods and 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 therefore preserve their political uh, stability and political uh, um, continuity. So so we have that and what you refer to as um, the lived religion, I simply refer to as a let's call it the popular cult um, because just like um, your your uh, examples of, of wearing the Star of David or, or things like that, that's not something that is uh, uh, set in the rules of the religion, but it's certainly something that is traditional and, and traditions here play uh, a very important role. And traditions, um, this is probably something that should have been uh, as a continuation of the quote that you brought, um, the popular traditions are just as important as the official religion, be, and, and sometimes even more so, because these are the things that um, really linger on, and, and this is, these are the things that are really part of the thing that makes a people a people. And I think that for instance, the Jewish people would not have remained a Jewish people if it was set solely on the belief in God. Like holidays and, and all these traditions that we have uh, that were practiced in the diaspora 
just like the Phoenicians, like the Greeks, you know, they acted uh, in a similar way um, uh, in, in, a, in the diaspora. That is the thing that made them, you know, Phoenicians or, or Greeks or, or Jewish or whatever. Um, yeah, so, so um, thank you for, for your uh, thoughts and maybe it is uh, worthy of, of rethinking these definitions. Um, yeah, I, I think <laughs> I'm done with that. And um, again, thank you all. And uh, I let Oren take the stage again. Uh, thank you all for attending this event and uh... Uh, until next time, I want to say. So we are closing. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye, thank you very much. Thank you.